Right, guys. Um, so um, I'm delighted to announce um, our keynote speaker, Mr. Peter Greenhouse, who is a consultant in sexual health and actually is an ex-Cambridge medical student. He matriculated here in 74, and his year group was the first ever year group as an Adam Brooks Clinical School. Um, he lectures internationally on all aspects of women's sexual health, is the British Medical Society accredited specialist, a keen graphic designer, a linguist and former comedy thespian, and a personal inspiration of mine. Um, he received the Bash Honorary Life Fellowship Award in 2017 and wrote chapter of SDIs for the 2018 edition of Dewhurst Textbook of Owen G. Um, so, can we give a round of applause for Peter Greenhouse, please? Oh, thank you so much. It's, a lovely, it's an absolute delight to be back at my alma mater. Um, uh, 30 odd, 30 plus, 35, no, more 40 years or so since I was here. Uh, this theatre wasn't here at the time, but uh, it's, it is lovely to be back. Uh, right, well, I'm going to entertain you and stimulate you on this, uh, this subject. Now, it looks like a rather boring title, but the most important bit is the bit at the top as to why do gynaecology. I'm going to break it down into a few, few sections, and these are the various different things. And I think everybody here, or most people here, should be able to manufacture at least some sort of personal motive that gives you a very good reason why you should have a, an interest, a, an individual personal interest, even if you're not actually interested clinically, because this is relevant to everybody in the audience, regardless of whether you happen to own your own set of cyclically varying hormones or not. Because you, if you don't, then you may actually love somebody or be related to somebody who does. And so you need to know all about this sort of stuff so you can advise them and help them and support them and occasionally get out of their way um, when absolutely necessary. So we're going to go through a whole load of this stuff and I thought I might as well do the intro uh, with, with a, 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 starting with a talk that I, the last talk I gave in Cambridge was some time ago to, the, to CULES, the Cambridge University Light Entertainment Society. So this is a little bit of my personal motivation, if you like. I was a thespian, basically. This is what Kills uh, was a great organisation, but uh, I, I, started, I was given this title, but I had to add something else in, and that was apart from chlamydia. So this is the thing that... that, that this, it was the 70s, for goodness sake. You know, the, the times were different. We didn't have to worry about HIV. Um, and uh, there was a more liberal attitude than sex and sexuality in those days, and we had four times more sexually transmitted infections, as measured by gonorrhea, than your generation did. So we were trying harder. You guys just haven't been trying hard enough. <laughs> so uh, let's just move on a little bit from that point. But if, if you think about it, you're in this environment and you've got to do something interesting. And of course, preclinical medicine wasn't at all interesting because Cambridge is probably the only place in the country that teaches uh, medical science with no relevance whatsoever to medicine. Um, uh, and I was rather bored, so I took up, I took up lights and sound and technicals, and uh, Kiel's was my lifeline, really. And I'd, basically, I did six years of comedy at Cambridge and a little bit of medicine on the side. Uh, so I did lights and sound, technicals, design posters and stuff like that, uh, and, pl and played in reviews and this sort of thing. And this is one of the early reviews done at, uh, at Addenbrooke's. I think that was the third year of Addenbrooke's uh, reviews. Anyway, thinking of the background of Cambridge, not at that time, but let's, let's think 400 years. This is Cambridge 400 years ago. Let's see if it's, if it's how things are. You can see people dancing, drinking, um, standing, around, standing around looking bored uh, and getting off with each other. So the question I have to ask you is, has anything changed in Cambridge in the last 400 years? I think not. Uh, well, let, let's, let's move, let, let's see if it has. So here we are, we have a, a, a close-up on what's going on in Cambridge nowadays. You can see they're quite interested, and we know that the prevalence in a city of undergraduates will be something of this order of 5 to 10%. And isn't it nice to know that your cumulative lifetime chance of exposure to chlamydia is anywhere between 30 and 50%? Turn to the person next to you and just think, there's a chance that one of you is bound to get chlamydia. Isn't that a lovely thought? And then, you can come and, and then you can come and see me sometime afterwards. It's nice to have a free NHS at the moment, isn't it, uh, to get your sexual health checks. Anyway, so this is chlamydia. We, this my generation, if you like, didn't really know very much about chlamydia. I was actually part of the educational team that put this together, but I didn't write the captions, and I know they were taking the piss. But there we go. That's life. So uh, chlamydia was the one that, uh, that most of us got. Um, but uh, the one that g gives us a yardstick, I mean, I, actually, how do you think doctors get interested in this subject, the subject of sexually transmitted infections, when they're medical students? If you think of all the things that you learn 
in medical school. Sec uh, uh, apart, uh, apart from the common cold, sexually transmitted infections are the infections you're most likely to get, and sexual health problems are the things that you or your friends are most likely to experience. So it has a direct personal relevance to everybody in the room, even those, especially those of you who are celibate and may want or may not want uh, to, uh, to start getting down to business. Um, uh, let's have a look at gonorrhea through the century, because this is a barometer of, uh, uh, of sexual mores and attitudes through, through the last century. War. War is the great aphrodisiac. If you're gonna die tomorrow, what are you doing tonight? Yes? <laughs> And then, of course, we have penicillin, which no longer works, but more of that later. Uh, and then we have this wonderful thing called the pill. Now, that's my generation, and it's just a lovely thought that in 1970, the long, hot summer of 1976 was the peak year for all oral contraceptive pill prescriptions. It was also the peak year for gonorrhea diagnosis in women, a great time to be 21 and at Cambridge. Thank you. <laughs> but then, of course, we didn't have to worry about this. And it's amazing how the fear of death, you know, this is, you know, you turn on the telly and there's these adverts, many, many of you here, not, born after this, uh, this campaign. But you can see you have 20 years of worrying about HIV and then suddenly you don't have to worry about it quite so much. And we'll come to the rest of that graph a little bit later to see what's going on nowadays. So let's move on. Oh, yes, yeah, so this is where it started, if you like. When I was a punk medical student in 1977, I saw my women friends being brutally mishandled by viciously unsympathetic GPs and a, one or two gynaecologists, sadly, and I got angry. Uh, and I decided that I, I, you, know, you didn't have to be a genius to work out that you could probably do it better than it was being done at the time because gynaecology was separated from sexually transmitted infections, was separated from, from uh, contraception, and it, you could go to lots of those different places and get different aspects of the same sexual health needs sorted out in different ways, never being sure as to whether somebody would be unpleasantly judgmental. And I didn't want that to happen to my women friends or to the, to the people I could look after. So I sort of asked myself a question, you know, what is sexual health? It's, a, it's a, well, we will come to a definition in a moment. Why do people have sex? Think about that. Most people have sex for recreation, uh, not procreation, and sadly some have for coercion as well. And there are lots of problems that they get, and certainly I reckon that anybody could do it better than it was being done at the time in the 1970s. And then to just have to finish it off, because I, I, I like to be a bit of a philosopher thinking about this, why are we here? And this next question is the most important question we'll ever ask anybody. Turn to the person next to you and ask, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> right. That's an important question. Maybe for later. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a nice, it's, a, it's not an overnight conference, is it? No, okay, sorry about that. Right, so this was my idea, to put women's sexual health care together so that we're not as physicians or clinicians or gynaecologists just interested in what's going on underneath the umbilicus. We're interested in the hormonal milieu and the mental profile. We're interested in the whole woman. I came up with this definition of sexual health published in the BMJ. Sexual health, the enjoyment of sexual activity of your choice. That's a bit of John Stuart Mill, rights and responsibilities, uh, without causing or suffering physical, physical or mental harm. That's simply primo non no care, the most important medical uh, ethical principle. So that wasn't, that wasn't difficult to put it together, but I don't think anyone else has put it in, in quite that way. I was also the first person in the country to tear down the sign saying genitourinary medicine. It used to be called gum. It's got, it has got something to do with oral sex, but that's by the by. Um, and I put up this sign. I was the first person in the country to put up this sign sexual health clinic. Basically, it's sexy and it's healthy. That's what it's, it does what it says on the tin. And once I'd done that for about eight years, then policy changed and I thought, yes, let's move somewhere else, move to a bigger place. So I moved to a centre of excellence in Bristol, which had these sort of facilities. Uh, you must think, you know, I'm completely mad moving to a porter cabin um, and I actually used this for the House of Commons Select Committee to get us more money. We won a 2.5 million grant. Uh, largest grant in the country to build a new clinic. Uh, but you, I don't know if you can read the bit at the bottom there. We're available for weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs. We'll take money from anybody. Uh, and we got a very big grant. We built a brand new clinic and that was it. And that was the team that I worked with until a couple of years ago. And this is my, the team I'm still working with now in Western Supermare. So that's what, that brings us up to date. Okay, so let's, uh, now I want you to turn to the person next to you and, uh, and ask uh, or answer the question, what is the commonest surgical emergency? Five seconds. Next person to you. Commonest surgical emergency? Well, we'll just give you a little clue. 
It's appendicitis. Yes, do you, some of you got that right. And, and of course, for those of you who have actually sat in, in, in a casualty department working out, is it, a, is it appendix, is it salpingitis? It's common, it occurs most commonly in young women, and you can, it may, there may be associated salpingitis. Well, the, the vast majority of them have a white appendix, a normal appendix. And of course, some actually have both, and it's difficult to say here, you have an appendix over the, the side wall and a tube ovarian complex in the background there as to which is which, whether it's a chicken and egg scenario. But this, this, this problem has been going on, well, for, for many, many years, and the earliest work I could find on this, for those of you who speak German, this is really excellent, uh, paper over a hundred years ago and it says the differential diagnosis between an excellent infection and appendicitis what look the Germans wonderful Bilde noch immer ein dunkles Gebiet in der Gynäkologie it seems even now even now in 1912 a dark area ein dunkles Gebiet a dark area in gynaecology well it's still a dark area and people make mistakes all the time come another 50 years on to the Lancet in 1961 and look at the age specific incidence of appendicitis uh, or appendicectomy in men, uh, starts at four, goes up to a peak at 12, and very relatively few people have their appendix taken after 30. And look at what happens to girls. There's a sudden peak between the age of 15, peaking up at 17, 18, and back down again to 20, 21, 23, or thereabouts. Well, I looked at that, subtracted one from the other, and that screams something to me. That, to me, is exactly the same as the incidence of, 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 of acquisition of chlamydia. So this is acquisition of infection after first sex and an individual, genetic, probably genetically predisposed, hyper-acute uh, reaction to infection with chlamydia. This is salpingo appendicitis, and that's only in one textbook, in one chapter, and it's only just been written. So get interested, because most people aren't taking any notice of this at all. So any of you about to do your surgical house jobs or get interested in surgery, start thinking about this. And can we do it better? Well, if you do the histology, you actually find that instead of the lumen being inflamed, it's the serosa. The external surface has plasma cell appendicitis pathognomonic of chlamydial infection. So could you do better in the emergency room? Well, yes, you could, because at the moment it used to be that you would do either surgery or watch and wait. But there's now a third way, which is to give antibiotics. And one of the things you can do, of course, is a near patient sexually transmitted infection test for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and perhaps some other things as well. And very few accident emergency departments, if, if any, are actually doing this, but it's not difficult to do, and the results you can get within, within 90 minutes. How long do they wait in an A&E department? Four hours? Well, you'll have a result before, before the doctor even sees them. Uh, nobody's doing this at the moment, so this is a project for any, any of you in the audience. And the whole point of putting this stuff up, these are research challenges. These are things that I've thought of, maybe written a little bit about, but haven't got round to doing myself because I haven't got OCD, I haven't got all the time in the world, I'm a clinician and sadly not a scientist. But there's stacks of stuff here for anybody who's interested to pick up and run with this. I'm looking for some clever sod in the audience who think, I could do that. That might be something interesting to do. And of course, what you may do is give the appropriate antibiotics, and ofloxacin seem to be used here. There's no blind treatment, in other words, you don't, you don't just bung antibiotics unnecessarily if the infection's not there. And of course, it makes you more uh, keen, perhaps, and more enthusiastic to do the surgery if you know there's no infection. Uh, and also, you can notify the partner quickly, uh, you know, within a few hours even, which has maybe a little bit of a problem, because it does depend on what the partner's doing at the time. Uh, but also, I suppose it depends on what their other partner is doing at the time. And there are, there are sensitivity issues here, of course. Uh, when you think about it, uh, most people aren't really sure about chlamydia, they get embarrassed about it, but basically most people have, get it from somebody who doesn't know that they've got it. So there's a lot of it about, and that's why many of you, whether you like it or not, will have had it already, even if you don't know it. Isn't that a cheering thought? Thank you. Let's move on to the next one then. Okay, so let's have a look at our next uh, research challenge. What is the commonest gynaecological complaint? Turn to the person next to you and we'll see what uh, answers you come up with. Commonest gynaecological complaint. Mm, some arming and ahhing. Okay, well in fact it's actually abnormal bleeding. Uh, and if you think about the sort of the things that we've just been talking about, periappendicitis and salpingitis, if you, ha you, if you have an ascending infection, it must have gone through the endometrium, and therefore you must have an endometritis. 
And that is a serious cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. And that, I commend to you, is something to think about, but most gynaecologists who are looking after women with abnormal bleeding don't look at it at all. Uh, and so particularly those who are looking after women with unacceptably heavy bleeding, where it hasn't been properly researched, it certainly recognises as a cause of irregular bleeding and postcoital bleeding and spotting, but not necessarily for menorrhagia. That work hasn't been done yet. But if you actually look at archived uh, endometrial biopsy samples, as this team did uh, in Seattle, 65 women with a primary diagnosis of, un of unexplained abnormal uterine bleeding, never tested for chlamydia, their biopsies were, were tested for chlamydia, and, and some were found to have 52 out of, uh, out of 65 were found to have uh, endometritis, plasma cell endometritis, uh, and 58% of those were chlamydia positive. So about half of all the women who had unexplained abnormal uterine bleeding had chlamydia. Now, no gynaecologist in the world is doing anything about that at the moment. Does that interest you or what? And the, uh, and the, the conclusion from this paper, wonderful. The effect of chlamydia on women of reproductive age is overwhelmingly underestimated. Isn't that a nice thought? So there's a huge opportunity for any of you guys to do some serious research. Remember, of course, the, the, the spectrum of chlamydial infection is from the asymptomatic millions to the moribund few, and we're interested in the bleeding and the discharge bit. And it's interesting if you go into a contraception clinic and look at uh, a bleeding pattern in, uh, in people who attend, you'll find that new attenders have 6% chlamydia, uh, women who have normal bleeding pattern about 11%, and about a third of women who've got recent onset intermenstrual spotting have got uh, chlamydia. So the commonest cause of intermenstrual bleeding in women uh, attending contraception clinics is? No, it's not taking your pills properly. It's, it's, it's chlamydia is the second commonest cause. So there we go. Also, if you actually take uh, azithromycin uh, and give it to uh, women who have abnormal bleeding, 50% of them seem to get better and there's no other trial that's actually done that. It took them a long time to do the work. It's not a very precise trial. But it's a rough idea that if you, if you throw antibiotic, the appropriate antibiotics at the right dose, uh, then you may make a difference to a significant number of women with abnormal bleeding. Instead of the classic management, which is to fiddle around with the dose of the pill, uh, certainly no, no indication whatsoever for biphasic or triphasic pills, nobody uses them anymore, uh, but you need to think about treating chlamydial endometritis, and very few people do. So chlamydia is probably the main cause certainly the main undiagnosed cause of interventional bleeding and abnormal uterine bleeding, might be a major cause of menorrhagia, but nobody knows. It's under-investigated. There's a research project. There's a PhD for somebody in the audience tonight. Today, tonight. No, it looks dark, but it's uh, today. Don't even know whether I'm coming or going up. I've not had a lot of sleep. Never mind. Let's press on. Oh, yes, actually, I must go about, about, the, about not having a lot of sleep. The, our, 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 our host today said that, that, you could, that if you want to go into gynaecology, you, 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 know, you, you don't want to be, uh, uh, you, you know, don't want to worry about missing your weekends. Well, I've done sexual health uh, where there's no nights, no weekends. Uh, it's, <laughs> I commend it to you. Uh, they're starting to do weekends now, but I, I never had to do any, which was quite handy, actually. So let's about think about the drugs of the bows, because you're throwing, if you're thinking about throwing out lots and lots of antibiotics, then you might get into trouble. And I'm just going to change the graphics a little bit. This is a, a lecture I gave in Paris quite recently uh, to some dermatologists uh, who, uh, who also are responsible for venereology in, the, in, in Europe. And we just looked at this very simple concept that simple sexually transmitted infections aren't simple anymore, and this is a big problem for anybody in the audience, regardless of whether you actually treat infections or not. Now let's have a look at this in a bit more detail and consider these three. We want to shine a light. It was called a spotlight session. So let's shine a light on this, uh, on this scenario of these three sexually transmitted infections that, that, that all impinge upon each other. Sometimes they're all there at the same time, and other times one will influence the other. So we've actually had simple diagnosis and simple treatment with azithromycin and testing for, with a nucleic acid amplification test, pee in a pot or take your own swab, not doing a culture. And there's a very simple equation here. Simple treatment plus simple diagnosis equals antimicrobial resistance. And we're in real trouble with this because if you think what's actually happening is that you take your simple treatment and you have this so-called bystander effect. This is obviously seen for hospital infections, but it's now being seen in a very big way for two other really important sexually transmitted infections. We'll only have time to do gonorrhea uh, to consider it. So I'm gonna, gonna take a little bit of time to do something really rather boring for you guys. I hope you guys don't go to sleep now because I'm gonna do some pharmacokinetics. That's another thing about Cambridge. Pharmacology in Cambridge is taught with no relevance to clinical medicine. 
so therefore, from my point of view, it was never very interesting. But I'm going to try and make this in interesting for you. Because when you take azithromycin, as some of you will have done, if you take a one gram dose only, it's on board for 10, for 10 days, which is enough to treat chlamydia uh, in the tissues, but not enough to treat in the serum, which is interesting. But let's just scrunch it up a little bit because it's got a long tail. If we move this graph a little bit uh, and scrunch it up a bit, what you've got is a very long tail. Uh, and the important thing is that if you then have intercourse, say, 10 days later, when you, when you think your chlamydia is cured, which it might well be, you've still got a load of azithromycin on board at a subclinical level, an increasingly dangerously sub clinical level. So you don't want to step on the long tail. So when I was teaching, when I was teaching uh, colleagues about this, I thought, think of an animal that's got a long tail. You really don't want to step on the long tail because that's where all the antibiotic resistance is coming and we've now got a big problem with azithromycin resistant uh, gonorrhea um, in people who've been treated for chlamydia. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, so let's have a look at gonorrhea and see where we're going with this. Uh, this is stuff I did for the BBC yonks ago, um, but to put it in better perspective, uh, there's been a campaign in Wakefield recently um, to uh, uh, not to let Leeds people get to their daughters because, uh, because the first uh, azithromycin-resistant outbreak took off in Leeds. And I was very surprised to find myself actually mentioned uh, in the press on this because I was the, the BASH uh, of British Association for Sexual Health and HIV uh, media spokesman for six years. And I used to, to, to be on telly and uh, on the radio for, and the papers for this sort of thing. Uh, and I got quoted by this, this thing called the BNFF. They said, scientists hardly surprised that super gonorrhea surfaced in Leeds. And they quoted me and they, they said, they said hey, well, it's the north, isn't it? A strain of mega gonorrhea. <laughs> A strain of mega gonorrhea could only have started there. I mean, Southerners having sexual intercourse with anyone from Scunthorpe or Leeds is, is incredibly rare. So I, I thought, I didn't say that. And I thought, good on you. This is fake news, but it's very good, very funny fake news. But it, it hides a very important truth. So let's look at, look, let's look at the, the downside of this scenario. We have un, uh, we're going to get untreatable gonorrhea very, very soon. Penicillin lasted for 30 years, Cipro lasted for only 20 years, interestingly, when there was very little gonorrhea around in the 80s and 90s because everybody was shit scared that they were going to die of HIV, and that's probably why ciprofloxacin lasted for so long. Remember, this is, a, this is an effect of Mr. Darwin. All you have to do is stick an antibiotic into a system, to a bug, and that bug will find ways around it by natural selection, and gonorrhea is very clever at doing this. And cefixime, another oral preparation, only lasted seven years, and now we have intramuscular keftriax, and we, we used to be able to just take a tablet, now you have to have an injection, and that is about to fail. Well, it's actually failing just now. It fails in all sorts of parts of the world, and the place that you wouldn't really want to go to is here, which is the Hainan Island Resort, where 13% of all the gonorrhea there is keftriaxone resistant. Anyone for a trip to Hainan? No, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> well, if they come back from there or anywhere in the southeast, uh, southeast Asia, they're going to be in real trouble. Um, and there's this, this is rather technical, so I'm going to simplify this from the Public Health uh, England. I, I've fiddled with the graphics here to make it look more interesting uh, and more easy to understand. And what you can see is what's called a sensitivity drift, that you need increasingly higher doses of antibiotic, uh, serum concentration of antibiotic to kill off the drug, to the point at which it becomes resistant, you can't increase the dose anymore. So that's where we're getting to with keftriaxone, our last available, easily given drug, well, if you consider int int intramuscularly given drug. So why is this happening? Well, the nice thing about it is that all the organisms that are in your throat have survived all the antibiotics you've ever taken. And Neisseria gonorrhea is very close to my Neisseria meningitidis, and it gets genetic information from it. And it's wonderful because also the drugs that you take to treat gonorrhea don't penetrate the pharynx very well. Isn't that handy? So you have suboptimal therapeutic levels in the pharynx. Uh, so you could, you could have urethral gonorrhea but still have it in your, in your throat uh, and you've got this drug tail of azithromycin if you've been for your chlamydia screening, so that won't have worked either. So the primary risk factor for, uh, for drug-resistant 
gonorrhea is fellatio, as practiced by all sorts of people in the world, including our friend here. Uh, just a practical demonstration for you. There's others, other, other politicians I could show you, but I think this is the one that I like best. Uh, but also, there is, a way, there is a way of getting rid of this, not getting rid of him, but getting rid of, uh, uh, of gonorrhea in the throat. You can just gargle with, with, uh, with Listerine. It doesn't kill the gonorrhea, but it makes it very inconvenient for the gonorrhea, so reduces the transmission efficiency. I commend it to you. There'll be a chemist just around the corner somewhere where you can go out and go buy your, your Listerine. Get, get your stocks in right now. Uh, also, it's not just from oral sex. It's also from kissing and the, the excellent group in Melbourne have now found from looking at the transmission dynamics in a group of, uh, of gay men that almost certainly there is more transmission of gonorrhea than can be accounted for by the amount of penetrative or, 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 or oral sex that's done. And it may be just deep kissing. Really, I mean, you've got to try hard, but deep, you know, some, some of you, I see some of you have been doing this sort of thing. Uh, deep, deep kissing is good enough to transmit gonorrhea, and we didn't know that, and that's quite important. And now we have XDR, extensively drug-resistant gonorrhea. A couple of, three cases uh, last year, and then suddenly we have these wonderful headlines. Skyrocket, super gonorrhea cases skyrocket in the UK. They skyrocket from one case to two cases, so that's... that's <laughs> That's a 100% increase. Well, yes, OK, but it's imp it, actually, it's, it's, it's very important why, it's only two cases, but why they were in separate parts of the UK. Uh, diagnosed at about the same time, women coming from, exact, from the same part of the same holiday destination in Europe. So this is really important. So if those two have managed to bring it in, then other people have got it as well. So it was completely resistant to keftriaxone, poorly sensitive to, uh, to azithromycin, resistant to everything else except spectinomycin, which is no longer manufactured and doesn't get into the throat anyway. So they were, they, they were both been to the same party island or been with somebody who'd been to the party island. Um, and it, Party island picture there. I mean, people do all sorts of things on holiday. Um, some of you have been, haven't you? Well, do come and get your check-up afterwards when you come home. Um, and interestingly, keftriaxone failed, and so the, the rescue medicine is three doses on three separate days of intravenous ertapenem. Uh, 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 now, can you imagine how logistically easy it's going to be to do that instead of just giving a tablet or giving an injection, uh, giving an intramuscular injection? That's what we're looking forward to in the future. Wonderful. Oh, guess what? And a heterosexual male contact had pharyngeal gonorrhea. As, did, as they did in the original cases seen the previous year. So the question is, is it kissing or is it cunnilingus? Well, once again, it just depends how hard you try. Think about it. I don't want to put you off or anything like that, of course, of course. So, yes, thinking of what's happening nowadays, let's just see what's going on. Oh, yes, there's a little bit of an increase, and it's helped by the wonderful technology that you have. Uh, at your disposal. Isn't it just brilliant to think that, you know, sitting on the desk in front of you or in your pocket, you could find the nearest available sexually active person who might be interested uh, to do things with you. Um, and for those of you who've, taken, who've not, never used that particular facility before, if you've ever used Uber, it's just the same. It's much easier to get a ride. <laughs> okay, now let's get to the... Mo I've now got all the nearly all the stuff out of the way. Now I've got to the bit that is most directly relevant to any of you in the audience. Pain and brain. These are the two principal causes of poor academic performance in women, and you need to know about these two uh, conditions. So we'll elaborate them in some detail, provided we've actually got time. What time am I supposed to finish? Oh, we're not doing too badly. I think we've got just about enough time. Good. Okay, so let's think of pelvic pain uh, and the different possibilities of pelvic pain, acute pelvic pain, it's PID, ectopic appendix. I put them all in red because they're all potentially caused by chlamydia. Chlamydia is almost certainly the primary cause of ectopic pregnancy, uh, and it's a major cause of pelvic infection, not the only one by any manner of means. So these are the acute causes, infectious causes of pelvic pain. What about the chronic? There are other, other acute causes, a UTI will do it, a cyst will do it, um, and what you've got here is a situation where you have acute and chronic, sorry, I've lost the, lost the thing here, acute and chronic gynae and gut, if you want to think of a way of, of, think, of, of, uh, of thinking about pelvic pain. But the chronic stuff is endometriosis and irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, this is actually on uh, e-learning for health. I wrote the, the 
wrote the um, section, the segment on pelvic inflammatory disease for that uh, uh, that that, um, that educational material. So if we look at this and think that there's a huge differential diagnosis here, particularly in the chronic uh, area here, is it PID, irritable bowel, or endometriosis? And lots and lots of women get the wrong diagnosis. Oh, time after time after time. Actually, if you think about the women in this situation, think back to your school days. In your class, there must have been at least one girl whose period pains were so bad that she couldn't turn up to school that day, or she'd be sitting at the back of the class hugging the radiator, or she'd have to go and lie down in the nurse's room. You wouldn't have chosen her for your netball team that day because she'd have been absolutely useless. Uh, and also, if she, uh, if she has a family history, uh, mother or sister or grandmother or first cousin uh, of, uh, of the same symptoms, then that's almost certainly endometriosis, and you can just make the diagnosis on the history alone. Uh, so the, this is a shame that the average woman spends about seven years before she's diagnosed with endometriosis. And you could probably make that diagnosis in a teenager in about a five or ten minute consultation without any great difficulty. And this is from the General Practice Research Database where they looked at women with subsequently proven endometriosis versus controls as to what, what they've been diagnosed with, with previously. So these women uh, with endometriosis were three, time, three and a half times more likely than controls to have been labelled as having IBS and they were six times more likely to have been inappropriately told they had pelvic infection and given antibiotics and maybe told to get their partner checked up or not as the case may be. So loads and loads of women get told they've got infection when they've actually got endometriosis. So they're given, the, these, the women who've got infection, who've got, got infection, they get antibiotics when they need hormones instead or a surgical investigation. So they are being routinely mismanaged. So what can you do about it? Question, is it endometriosis or is it endometritis? And this woman has mild salpingitis, uh, endosalpingitis, and also I missed at the time when I took this photograph many, many years ago, uh, I missed a spot of endometriosis on the broad ligament. Very easy to miss. Um, and the two conditions can, uh, can occur uh, uh, simultaneously, of course. Uh, it's just to show you a couple of, the, the, of these, these clinical pictures because uh, these photographs were taken uh, when uh, well, long before we had video laparoscopy. So, let's think about these two conditions, endometriosis or PID. Well, all these women, women have all these symptoms. The symptoms are exactly the same. So it's quite easy to see how you can make a different, you can, you can get the diagnosis wrong. Uh, women with endometriosis don't tend to have a pyrexia. And interestingly, most women uh, with PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, pelvic infection, don't have uh, a pyrexia unless they have a very severe salpingitis. But what, do they ha what does one group have that the other one doesn't? Dysmenorrhea is the thing that really gives you the clue. They have painkillers and HWB. Okay, I invented this sign, HWB, hot water bottle sign, HWB positive. So, thinking about the hot water bottle sign, if you have a, a woman who regularly, on a monthly basis, uses a hot water bottle on her abdomen, then you have to think endometriosis. However, if you're in, acute, in the acute scenario in the uh, accident emergency department or your gynae take or whatever it happens to be, and you find a woman who's using a hot water bottle for the first time in her life, what does that tell you? It tells you she probably hasn't got endometriosis, but also it tells you she has an acute, acute abdomen of some sort doesn't give you the diagnosis, but it certainly gives you some serious clues. So hot water bottle sign is very important. So also the pain tends to get better when they're on the pill or depot or, or a, a hormone coil at the Mirena. Uh, not always. With really severe endometriosis, the pill doesn't seem to make an awful lot of difference. They've got a, uh, oh yes, there's something else, defecation pain, Me technical term, menstrual dyskesia. This is pathognomonic of deep infiltrating endometriosis of the rectovaginal septum. That's quite a nice, uh, quite, quite a nasty acronym, isn't it? D-I-E, because that's how women feel, because these women actually literally go white as a sheet and are sweating as they're trying to defecate during their period. And that's a classic sign, and that almost 100% for rectovaginal or, 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 or pouch of Douglas and rectovaginal endometriosis. And once again, it's nearly always misdiagnosed or not diagnosed far too late. Uh, so let's just think where that pain is and the classic pain, although a lot of women get pain over the lower abdomen, other women will get pain in the, in the spine, uh, not as if they're being stabbed in the back, but as if somebody, they feel as if somebody has a knife inside them trying to pin them to the wall uh, or pin them to their chair. 
So they, they, they have a hot water bottle on the back of the, uh, uh, on the, in the small of the back. And in fact, some of them have this HWB squared sign, which is one on the front and one on the back. Okay, pretty pathognomonic of endometriosis. And of course, family history is really important. It's not 100%, uh, of course, but any, for instance, a woman who has, uh, a woman with endometriosis who has three daughters has a sporting chance that two of them will have, uh, or two of them will have endometriosis, and it is 100% concordant in monozygotic twins. So that gives you a clue to think about. And that's what it looks like. Interesting, you can sometimes see it on the cervix. Let's go close up to that. That's re relatively rare to see overt endometriosis. Uh, think about the pain that people get. Uh, one of the things that they never get taught about, uh, and in fact this is not in any gynae textbook at all, and I, sadly I haven't published it yet, but is talking to lots of women about the pain that they get. It's a very, this is the classic pain-fear cycle, uh, and it goes on and on and on until somebody actually breaks the cycle and tells them to do full, the full range of non-penetrative sexual activity until so, some clever bastard can actually make the diagnosis and get on and sort out the treatment. So this is uh, some work that I've uh, not published, but I've shown at a few, uh, few conferences, just by chatting to women who've got endometriosis about what they can and can't do sexually. Pain on top is the classic thing. Uh, uh, and looking at the positions, so if you're sitting on top, then that's deep penetration into the uh, rectovaginal septum. And there's often you can find a trigger point at a certain number of centimetres depth, and that means they can't do sitting on top. It's also pain, severely painful to have uh, pain uh, from behind or doggy style sex or indeed a missionary position with legs behind your head that sort of thing uh, the only position that actually works is if you're lying on your side uh, and your, your partner is behind you pushing forward spoons position works and for those of you because because of course the the, the posterior fornix isn't being uh, uh, impinged upon the problem with that position of course you don't get any clitoral stimulation so you either have to do it yourself or find a man with long arms uh, or if you're being particularly adventurous, you use the astride position where, where you start in the missionary position and then the man puts his legs outside the woman. That actually seems to work quite well because similar to the spoons position, the, there's a, a, quite a distance before the penis goes in, so the depth of penetration is shallow and all the friction is up against the clitoris, which could be quite useful as far as I know. Anyway, I commend it to you. Anyway, this is the thing from the e-learning for health, and I'm sorry I'd lost the original picture there, and it doesn't show up very well there, but this is a 24-year-old woman who had erythema ab igne over her lower abdomen from her hot water bottle. Pretty diagnostic uh, of endometriosis. And just think of what a difference that would make. If you had undiagnosed endometriosis uh, and your, your period started on the day that you were doing your A-levels, how, how well are you going to perform it? Or indeed your finals, if you haven't had it sorted out by then. How well are you going to do? Not as well as you might. You will be performing somewhat lower than you could think. And if you think of putting this all together then, we've talked about bleeding, not just being caused by your hormonal profile, but being caused by infection. We've talked about pain, not being caused by infection, but be, being caused by your, horm your, your genetics and your hormonal uh, situation and your pathology, if you like. So if you, have, if you think about it, you take women who've got heavy menstrual or intermenstrual bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding, they're probably going to get hormones and some of them will actually need antibiotics. That's a bit sad. But if you want to really do better quality women's sexual health, then you've got to put the whole woman together and you've got to look after these two conditions at the same time because women who've got deep dyspareunia, lower abdominal pain, are going to get given antibiotics. They'll probably have to take them anyway just in case. But in fact, many of these women eventually need hormones and not antibiotics. Unless you can do this as a whole subject in one, then you're going to miss a lot of, uh, well, a lot, uh, a lot of women are going to get missed. So, once again, is it endometriosis or is it endometritis? You decide. And of course, there are some women who've got both, and that's really confusing. So, to finish, and actually we don't really have time to do justice to this bit, so in fact, for those of you who are very interested in this arguably most important part of the lecture, um, uh, uh, Cara has a, um, a, uh, uh, an email string with lots of links to various different um, educational resources that you may find interesting for those of you have, who have significant cyclical mood change. So we'll do, see, see if we can run through this very, very quickly. Um, so we're just going to change the graphics a little bit, but this is, this is why I'm so interested in women's health, because it, when you drop the level of estradiol, it will cause a mood effect in not all women, but in many women. So women are so much more interesting 
than men. I mean, men are straight, really, you know, there's so many things to go wrong. To, I mean, I'm sure you've seen various different versions of this slide before, but this is my particular version. I took ages to do the graphics on it. But men are simple creatures. They only need a few things to keep them happy. They need, they need a snooze button, of course. But this is the effect of having stable testosterone. If you have a stable testosterone level, then your mood doesn't change at all. You have no excuse for being moody. Absolutely no excuse for being moody. Whereas women are built to change or, or have to work hard against the change in mood and, and other aspects of cognition that may occur. We did some work on, I did some work on this with Professor Alice Roberts uh, for, uh, for Women's Hour, uh, and we can send you the links to that. And this is something that most of you don't know, and I understand you recently had a lecture or some queries about whether the pill affects mood and vice versa. Uh, well, it does. So it's one of these unfortunate facts of life that the most cheapest and most commonly prescribed pill in, in Europe is, le is levonorgestrel, uh, levonorgestrel combined pill, Microgyne and Ovronet, Levest, Rigivin or Maxeni. And that has the highest side effect profile because it's closest structurally to testosterone. Uh, and the ones at the bottom of the list are much less androgenic, so they're much less likely to cause mood side effects, but some of them may actually cause less libido. So hardly a day goes by clinically where I don't switch a woman from uh, a microgynon pill to Celeste or whichever those trade names that you want to use. So this is standard stuff, and anybody uh, started on a pill should know about this. Uh, but most people don't and they never get told it and they often get told, oh, well, it's just, it's just you, don't worry about it. But of course, serious mood and cognition problems are the primary reason for women to discontinue the pill, so you do need to know about it. Oh yes, and here's another thing, progesterone intolerance uh, to any progesterone, about 5% of women are, uh, are intolerant to all progestogens uh, and that predicts PMS. So, let's have a look at severe, really severe PMS, or PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's a genetic predisposition. Uh, about 3 to 8% of women, average around 5% of women, are seriously affected by this. Uh, and interestingly, there's only one group in the, in the, uh, in the world that really is understa uh, understands this. And if you, if you take women who have had bad mood or bad uh, cognition problems, uh, or, or, or basically dysphoria on levonorgestrel, if you stick them in an MRI and give them levonorgestrel, their amygdala lights up in a different area to most other women. So these are, there's a brain structure phenomenon here and there's an awful lot of work. There's several PhDs worth following uh, for, from that research alone, but that's only being done in, in Uppsala at the moment. Anyone want to go to Sweden? Well, yes, maybe. Uh, so if you have uh, severe mood problems when you take your microgynon or whatever those pills are, you are much more likely to get premenstrual dysphoric disorder when you get into the perimenopausal phase in your life in your, in your 30s and 40s. You're also at much, much greater increased risk of uh, a postnatal depression, which is intriguing. So, the mechanism of PMDD is largely due to unstable oestrogen levels. Uh, and if, you f if your level of oestrogen falls, that's classically when you get the symptoms the last four or five days of the period. But some women actually get uh, mood uh, and cognition problems in mid-cycle as well. Uh, that's a, a proportion of women with PMS. Uh, but if you really want to, re so, it, so it's basically, if you, have a sta if, you, if you have a stable level of oestrogen, it doesn't matter how, how high it is or low it is, provided it's stable. So at the start of your, your cycle, your oestrogen is low, it's stable, your mood is stable, it rises, your mood remains stable, it falls, then your mood changes. Uh, and that's the primary mechanism involved. But also there's progesterone hypersensitivity. For the women who are for only one week normal, the rest of the time many of them describe themselves as a Jekyll and Hyde character or, or some have described themselves as psycho bitch from hell. That's uh, familiar for some of you, perhaps. Uh, and it's caused by, by excess uh, uh, progesterone hypersensitivity, and these women will be hypersensitive to any pill uh, that you put them on, and also to their own uh, endogenous progesterone. And they can only be helped by complete suppression of the, of the menstrual cycle. So, here's the thing if you want to try and make this diagnosis. It's an important logical principle that if you have any physical or mental condition with a precise, repeating, cyclical fluctuation and cyclical timing must have a hormonal cause. So it could have a hormonal solution. That has enormous biological plausibility, but there are no RCTs to prove it, which is interesting because all of these conditions occur in the luteal phase. It's fascinating that 25% that that of all, all hospital admissions for fatal and near-fatal asthma occur on the day of menstruation. 
Is that interesting for those of you with asthma? Or for, you don't have to be a chest physician or immunologist to get interested in that. Also, epilepsy is much more likely to happen just around the time of uh, menstruation. And also, sciatica, arthritis, also these effects on cartilage of estrogen uh, and also effects on the immune system as well. Dermatology, huge numbers of conditions only occur in the luteal phase or are triggered in the luteal phase and get better after menopause or get better during pregnancy or get better uh, after, after surgical menopause. And I put the herpes up there because I'm actually currently the only person in the world using transdermal estrogen to treat herpes, but that's another story in another lecture. Okay, so let's think about these premenstrual symptoms. I mean, for those of you who actually know this and, and or live with somebody who's got this, this list is pretty obvious, actually. Uh, and there are a whole load of other ones. You go on and on and on down the list. And we put the joint pains in there because that's, it. that's very interesting because a lot of people get labelled as having fibromyalgia. And if their symptoms are cyclical, it's not fibromyalgia. It's estrogen-induced uh, cartilage-induced uh, joint pain. And if we look at a group of Indian medical students, so people of your sort of, your sort of age, uh, there's a significant incidence of premenstrual dysphoric disorder in these medical students, 70% of them feeling sad, but in the middle here, about 35% got body ache or joint pain. So what about these symptoms? I mean, you, you, obviously, you, it's even worse, if your GP diagnoses depression, you're not, you may feel depressed and the GP will diagnose it and you think, is this normal? Am I going completely stark staring mad? Like, well, uh, we can't possibly, possibly comment in the current political circumstances, but uh, it's very important for any young woman to be able to make that diagnosis in herself and find a clinician who knows what they're talking about rather than one who denies the existence of mood problems with a normal cycle. So, actually, I'm probably gonna to have to skip the case scenario. Kevin, are you right for another five minutes? Do you think, are we, are we okay for five more minutes? Yeah, yeah. Five more minutes, okay. So we'll just do a case scenario which will involve a quick question to you. Okay, so I've got a 35-year-old teacher whose period pains got worse when uh, she had an IUD put in because she had to stop taking com a combined pill because she got migraine with aura, a fairly common phenomenon. She has a history of time off school and severe period pains, and both her mother and her sister have the same symptoms. So what is her first diagnosis? Endometriosis, thank you very much, very obvious. Next, uh, remember she's 35, she has increasing mood problems and joint pain, pains over three years. She, they're getting much worse over the last, uh, last month. Some women with this, this sort of condition, you, get, you can actually say there's a particular month where it gets worse just like that, or it gets gradually worse, very variable. Uh, and she's been given, not unreasonably from the GP, citalopram because she's depressed, nitrosepam because she can't sleep, and ibuprofen for her joint pains. And armed with these three drugs, she makes a suicide attempt. Also, oh, what's her diagnosis there? What's the diagnosis on the, of those symptoms? PMS or PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Well, it's, it's premenstrual dysphoric disorder because she actually makes a suicide attempt on the day before each of the previous three periods. Interesting? Very interesting indeed, because she came to see me two days before her next period, and I had to do something about it. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and see what would you do in this situation? Would you increase your dose of citalopram, switch to another SSRI, refer to a community physician, phone a friend, or something completely different? Just a couple of seconds chat as to what you might do in this situation. Because this woman, is, this, this woman can be rescued. Okay. All right. Well, what, what did I do? I considered this paper essential, for, essential reading for anybody who wants to know about mood uh, and hormones uh, and unnecessary psychiatric treatment. Um, the, the confusion with bipolar disorder uh, can, be, can be battered away by finding symptoms that get better during pregnancy or breastfeeding or after uh, or, or in medical, medical or surgical menopause. Uh, and these women who got severe PMS do not respond to antidepressants. And of course, nearly all of them who are given antidepressants, particularly for the SSRI uh, group, will not be told that they have a 70% risk of anorgasmia. Now, no GP gives out that information, but it's in the small print. I don't think many people would be keen to take these drugs, particularly for, uh, for these conditions when there's an alternative solution. So you give them a daily score chart, and this is what we did for this woman. 
we uh, we looked at we, we got her to 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 um, to record her daily symptoms, and immediately we started her on trans. We stopped all took all the tablets away, gave her transdermal estrogen, uh, and fitted an IUS. So in her first period. Uh, she actually still had very severe uh, mood problems and she had suicidal ideation, but no suicide attempt, perhaps because we'd taken her pills away. And if we just follow this on, uh, in, we, we, she then stopped the medication for just two days and look what happened to her mood. Uh, the mood came back very quickly after she stopped her, her transdermal estrogen. So in the next period, her score's 27 out of 35. And then, then she, we dropped the dose to half the dose uh, and she also got a mood effect. And finally, in the last period, we handed her back to the GP, more or less sorted out, not having any further need to consider the need for, uh, for, um, uh, for suicide. So uh, period pains improved with an IUS, which is exactly what you'd expect. The mood improved with transdermal estrogen, which is also what you'd expect. It doesn't work for everybody, but it works for the vast majority of women with severe uh, PMS, PMDD. No further suicide attempts. Magically, her breast tenderness and joint pains got better and she went back to the GP with one prescription and no need for all these drugs that are routinely given out in their thousands or millions to women in this country and around the world. Is that interesting? I hope it is, because if that doesn't get you interested in doing gynecology, doing sexual health, doing contraception, doing any field aspect of, of women's health, psychosomatic obstetrics and gynecology, any of that stuff, then nothing is going to shift you. But I hope I hope that has alerted you to how important this is because it's not, you know, lots of jokes are made about PMS, but it's not a laughing matter because it destroys lives, it destroys relationships, and it can seriously impinge upon academic careers if your PMS hits while you're supposed to be doing uh, your exams. So, let's just finish off. I've gone from the Addenbrooke's Review to being the medical advisor to the Great Wall of Vagina. I don't know whether that's much of an achievement or what. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, this is, this is Addenbrookes and this is nowadays. Um, also, this is where you guys might end up. This is a sort of take-home message, really, because isn't it a wonderful thought, once again, that you could easily walk out of here and acquire an infection just thanks to the pers person you contacted on your phone. So I think we need to start drawing a veil uh, over this. Um, uh, so the take there's an there's a important take-home message here, that if you're using Tinder and you find somebody you don't like, wouldn't it be nice if you could just stay safe and swipe left? If only we could do that in real life. So let's go on. It's useful to... Uh, this is the, my last slide for Paris, and this was my last slide. I gave this, uh, the same lecture in, uh, uh, in, in Denmark uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I finished with a similar sort of message here. Um, uh, but you can use this, um, uh, well, in any scenario. So trying to answer this question, what are you doing tonight, or what are you going to do with your careers? Because I hope, once again, that I've filled you with some degree of enthusiasm for the subject. And just as a final sort of take-home message, if you are going to get out there in the sexual marketplace and you're going to use condoms, uh, well, you need, to, you need to watch out for kissing as well as cunnilingus and all that. And if you're going to be keen on using condoms, for God's sake, don't stick them on your head. Thank you very much.